Before there were smartphones, we still had plenty of information available at our fingertips in magazines. Jim Axelrod speaks with an unusual collector whose passion is in pages. I grew up in the era where when you're on the cover of life, you've made it. That's, it's the greatest thing ever. The boldest of bold-faced names. You could call Dr. Stephen Lamezo America's most passionate collector of magazines. But that would be underselling. It's one thing to develop a, a hobby. Yes. It's another thing to have that hobby mushroom into a situation where you own 83,000 magazines. That's true. That's right. 83,000 magazines, 7,000 different titles. A collection he started after stumbling into an old bookstore in Chicago while in medical school. It had the first issue of Look Magazine. At least that's what they said. And sure enough, I look inside and it says, Look Magazine, volume one, number two. And I said, what was number one? And the dealer says, we don't know. Well, that's hooked me. Dr. Lamezo has selected 200 from his collection, recently on display at the Grolier Club in New York City. The exhibit, now online, Magazines and the American Experience, looks at how we used to conduct data searches for more than two and a half centuries. These days, if you want some information, you turn on your phone or you turn on your laptop and you Google a term and you say, okay, I want to hear about Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So 10 pages come up. In the early days, what did you do? You went to Life magazine and you say, well, let's find articles about President Roosevelt. So Time and Life and right. Newsweek and Look and People and Sports Illustrated, this was the internet before the internet. Absolutely. That's where you went when you wanted to get information. They're all here, from a New York Weekly journal dating to 1733 to the 19th century intellectual Bibles still published today. From rarities like the Hobo News to Norman Rockwell covers for the Saturday Evening Post, to magazines covering every hobby, sport, issue, interest, and type of humor. They're all represented. The one that comes off the top of my head is People with a Hand Fetish. There's a magazine for that. There's magazines for everything. There's always a magazine. American magazines attract great interest abroad. There's something very democratic, I think, about the magazine. They've always been a sort of glue says the exhibit's curator, Julie Carlson, that held communities together, especially marginalized ones, and gave them a voice. History is written by the victors, but they are usually standing on a platform of many other people whose stories maybe aren't heard. And when you look at magazines, because they were a little bit more informal, everyone could make them. So you have all these voices and you see a, a really complete picture. Take the Harlemite from 1963. If you ask a lot of people what was happening in Harlem at the 1960s, they might think of civil rights unrest that was happening at that time. When in fact, here you have this wonderful magazine of literature and music and just shows a thriving arts community, which completely disrupts that narrative. Or one magazine, which advertised science and satire on its cover, but was actually America's first magazine for gays. It's very plain. It looks like you're just reading a regular digest, so it says a lot about what you were allowed to be seen reading at the time and how sneaky perhaps you had to be to get the information you wanted to get when you couldn't just open a private browser on your computer. And yet for the people reading it, it may have been a bit of a lifeline. Exactly. And Magazines gave our culture a place for Hemingway to first publish and photojournalism to take root. The Atlantic turned Paul Revere into an icon by publishing Longfellow's poem about him, and Harper's Bazaar vaulted cover girl Lauren Bacall into Hollywood royalty. Looking back on it, magazines were important at the time, but it takes someone like Stephen to collect all of them to be able to look back and say, oh wow, they, they really served a bigger purpose than maybe we fully appreciated. This exhibit sort of feels a little bit like a wake. Well, this is actually in a way, the epitaph of the printed American magazine. But Steve Lamezo had a great run, ever since that day nearly half a century ago, when that dealer described the mythical Look Magazine Volume 1, Number 1, often talked about, but rarely, if ever, seen. I've seen three of them in my life. I own two of them now. Of course you do. Yes. <laughs>